be awesome. All right, so 1 John chapter 2, uh, we will begin in verse 28. Would you stand as we read the Word of God out of honor and respect for it? 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink back from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself and as he is pure. Let's pray. Father, uh, we are blessed beyond all people to have your word uh, before us today. We know that there are, are believers um, throughout the world today who would, would give their lives to have a copy of your word. So we're grateful today that, that we have so many copies and we can so freely stand together and read it and proclaim it. So we're grateful for that. I pray that we'll not take it lightly, Lord. I pray that for the next few minutes that we will immerse ourselves in your word, that we will breathe your breath today that you'll be glorified and that we will be um, benefited from our time together and from hearing your word today, Lord. And be with me as I strive to be obedient and preach your word. Give me boldness and power and compassion and grace. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And thank you again for standing. Well, last week we looked at this idea of certainty. I've said many times now in the book of 1 John that this is a book that helps us to know that we indeed have a relationship with God the Father through His Son, Jesus. It is a book that gives us assurance. So if you've questioned yourself in that area, do I really belong to the Lord Jesus? Do I really belong to God? This book will help us to know that. That word know is used so many times over and over and over. And the, the main reason is to give us assurance, but it's also kind of a roundabout way of speaking to the Gnostics that we talked about in the very first uh, couple of sermons. The Gnostics were a religious sect that thought that they had a secret knowledge that nobody else had, and that if you didn't have their secret knowledge, then you, you didn't have this relationship with God. And Paul uh, or John, the apostle, John came in and absolutely straightened them out. That's why he uses, I believe, the word know so much that we actually have genuine knowledge of the biblical Christ. And that is fleshed out in so many ways. In this passage, he's saying it's fleshed out in the idea of childhood, that we genuinely in Christ are children of God. And guys and gals, if, if you have walked in this place and you're depressed, if you're down, if you're just in a stupor of some kind and you want out of it, then you immerse yourself in this passage and understand that in Christ, by trusting Jesus, you are a child of the Most High God. Amen. That'll pull you from the deepest, darkest depression when nothing else will. You are a child of God in Christ. We saw several things last week. The first thing we saw was to abide in Jesus, to abide, to remain in, to tarry with, to stay with the gospel. And this is evidence that you are genuinely a child of God. And we spent some time talking about that. And we, we talked about abide so we won't shrink back from him when we see him. We saw that in the verse, in the passage as well. We looked at Moses on the mountain, how, how glorious it was when he saw just a glimpse of God and how 
We cannot shrink back from the glory of God when we see Him because we are children of God, and that's the only way that could happen. We also saw that when you abide, uh, that you are to abide so you can point people to Jesus. But then we saw that we are to exult in God's love. He says, what kind of love is this that we are children of God? And we talked about how amazing it is to be identified as a child of God. Of God. And it's because of His love toward us, the Almighty, the Creator, that that love that we can't fathom, He poured out on us. And because of that, we are children of God. And that is fleshed out in several ways. We talked about realizing His love leads to adoption, and we talked about the idea of adoption and how amazing it is. And this church has been touched in so many ways by it by adoption. I, I learn more and more uh, as I stay here about how many of you have either been adopted or have adopted someone or have a story about that. It, it's phenomenal. I was sent a story after the sermon last week about adoption. It just blew my mind. Adoption is such a sweet thing. And then flowing out of that that we are absolutely His. In Jesus, we are absolutely a child of God. He said it's written in stone. We bear his name. It is a legal transaction. And then we learn that we are to expect the world to be perplexed by our relationship with Jesus. And we see that in this passage. They don't understand that. They may even call it arrogant. You're telling me that you know, you can know that you're a child of God? And it does not make sense to the world. If you've never been adopted by God Himself, if you've never been born again into His family, that doesn't make any sense. But if you have, it makes more sense than we could even explain. So, that brings us to the last two points of this very long extended sermon. They are this. These two points are look forward to conformity with Jesus and rest in your completion. This is all stemming from being a child of God. Certainty of childhood. We're, we're giving you assurance that if you've trusted Jesus, you are a child of God. So, let's begin to look at this idea of looking forward to conformity with Jesus. Look, look back at the text. We'll start in chapter 3 and focus on verse 2 to begin with. But we'll read verse 1. See what kind of love... The Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Then verse 2, Beloved. Often I say when I'm trying to help us to understand how to study Scripture, to look at every word in a verse. And dwell on that one word for a moment. Then take it in its big picture, but look at each word. And look at this first word, beloved. Beloved, this is what the sovereign creator God that right now is keeping all the galaxies in place. Y'all, I was walking to my truck the other night. Turned the light on. It was dark outside. I had to get the phone charger out of my truck. And I heard the neighbor calling me. He said, Joey. Scared me to death. It was dark outside. I said, what was that? I didn't know if God was calling my number or what was happening. But, <laughs> but he kept calling. And I finally realized it was my neighbor. And he said, come here. It was just strange. And I, I didn't say anything. I just kind of looked around. I couldn't see anything. And he finally said, I'm in the front yard. And I thought, he's been bitten by a snake or something. He's laying there dying. I didn't know. But I made my way over there. I didn't have my shoes on or anything. And so I tiptoed over there through the fire ants and whatever. And there he had a telescope set up. And he was looking at the, the planets. And he showed me Jupiter first. And, and, and I was amazed. You could see lines on Jupiter. Then he said, check this out, man. This is amazing. That was actually his quote. Check this out, man. And he put it on Saturn. And I could literally see the rings around Saturn was phenomenal and and I knew that I've seen pictures of it and all of that and and I know it's there but to see it 
And it just was like, God, you are absolutely, it, you, you blow my mind. You are amazing. You, you are so fantastic and beyond my imagination. This is the God that made that planet and kept it there. And I don't care how much aerosol we put in the air. I mean, we ought to be careful there, of course. But it ain't going nowhere until God's done with it. He is that phenomenal. And it is that God. Ram yeah, Ramona puts enough in it with her hair. That's what she's giggling about over there. If there's any holes in the ozone, we know why. Y'all got me so off track. <laughs> it is that God, though, that is so incredibly amazing that he could keep all that aerosol that Ramona puts in the air from, from damaging his creation. And this is the God who says this, Beloved, beloved, we are God's children now. Make that connection. This is not some man-made God. This is the living, eternal God who calls us His children. Grasp that today. We are His children now, and what will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. So, look forward to conformity with Jesus. He says... This is the God, we are His children, and look forward to what we will be one day. So, with that being said, we're talking about being children of God. And he's, He said, I want you all to look forward to what you're going to be one day. It's difficult to look at us now, <laughs> right? If you're like me, you go, I, I mess up so very much. And you get tired of sin, you get tired of the state that we're in right now. But it's going to change, okay? And we're going to look at that. So I want you to, to mark where you are right now, but then turn over to Ephesians with me. To the left in your Bibles, to the letter to the church at Ephesus by the Apostle Paul, who wrote this sweet letter to them. If we really want to understand who we're going to be and how precious that is, we need to spend just a little while thinking about who we were before Jesus. That is priceless. We have to remember that. We need to remember where we've come from. If you're in a good financial state right now, it's good to know that. It's good to, to thank God for that. And a good way to do that is think of where you come from. That's easy for most of us to do. And this is what Paul, exactly what he does in the book of Ephesians to the believers at Ephesus. He's reminding them where they were spiritually at one time without Jesus. And then he reminds them who they are in Christ. So, so chapter 2, look at it. And you were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Folks, that statement in, it, in and of itself is enough to put things back to center. Um, I, I've told you this before. Um, use this illustration many times, but working in a funeral home, this strikes a chord with me because I saw that so much, this idea of death. And he, he, Paul often, often uses the analogy of the human body when he's speaking of spiritual things. And this way he speaks of death. You were dead in, in your trespasses and sins. It's, it's your sin that caused you to be there. When you were born, you had the nature of sin in you, which is death, leads to death. It is death. And look at this, in which you once walked. It's who you were. It's all of you were involved in that motion, going to that destination. You walked in death, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Lest we, as believers, become prideful and arrogant, and egotistical, you are nothing without Jesus. For this is who you were. This is who we were before Jesus came along, past your rottening body, past that awful smelling tomb that you were laid in and said, Live. This is who we were. 
And we followed Satan himself. Sometimes we do become prideful and we, talk, we become pious in a bad way and we forget where we came from. But the Bible says before Jesus, we followed Satan. And the Bible's clear on that. Jesus said, you were either for me or you're against me. There's no middle ground with this idea of salvation. None. You're either for Jesus or you're with Satan. One or the other. And he said, Paul told these believers that before Jesus came along and saved them, before they trusted in him, they followed Satan. This is bad stuff, isn't it? The spirit is now, uh, that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we once all lived in the passions of our flesh. Whatever our flesh, fallen, depraved flesh desired, that was our life. That's what we desired. That's what we lived for. It wasn't for the glory of God. It wasn't to see Him one day. It was none of that. It was for the passions of our flesh. And do y'all see that in our world today? You know, that's why laws are being passed or being pushed to be passed because of people's fleshly desires. People are being voted on not for moral sake. None of that typically is for here's my fleshly desire. I'm going to find somebody, some politician that agrees with what I want, that my flesh wants, and that's who I'm going to vote for because I want to do whatever I want to do legally. That's where our world is today. And this is, Paul says this is who we all were at one time. This is nasty stuff, isn't it? Right? Here we go. He's not done yet. And we're by nature. It's who we were. Children, it, I promise it gets better, folks. Children of wrath. The wrath of God is being stored up. The wrath of the living God being stored up behind these, these supernatural gates. Getting ready to be unlatched and unleashed on those without Christ. This is what Paul is saying. And we were children of that wrath. It's who we were. By nature, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So I had to spend just a few moments. And I'm, I'm sure you all are glad it's just a few moments. We need to get beyond this, don't we? To remind us of who we were. It is good to be reminded of who we were. Years ago, I bought a truck, and I was going to try to be frugal. First new vehicle I ever bought. So I went to uh, the GMC dealership here in town, or in Wilmington, and I said, I want the most scaled-down model you can possibly get me. I don't want a radio in it. He said, well, they've come with at least an AM radio. I said, whatever, I'll listen to WKLM. <laughs> whatever. Y'all remember that? A long time ago. And whatever, and no air conditioner. He said, man, you better get an air conditioner. I said, nope. I just scaled down truck, stick shift, all of that. So that's what I got, a little GMC S15 truck. It did have some pretty cool rims on it, but other than that, it was just plain old blue vinyl seat, dark blue truck with no air conditioner. Y'all know what I'm saying. In the summertime, I, I was a plumber at that time and worked outside all the time. And I'd get in that truck, and it was hot. I mean, guys, it was so hot that when I would try to get out of, out of it, after riding in it for some time when it was in the high 90s or right there at 100 degrees with no air conditioner, I would have to peel myself off of that <laughs> vinyl seat. In that truck, it was hot. Some of y'all know Bill Bennett, uh, Dr. Bill Bennett, great godly man, um, and he mentored me for some time, believe it or not. Maybe the only mentorship he failed in, but, but he mentored me for some time. And he needed me to help him move, so I was helping him move, and he wanted to ride with me. I said, Dr. Bennett, I don't think this is a good idea. So he said, no, I'll be okay, I'll be okay. That's how he talked. And he got in the truck, and we rode, going down the road, and it was hot, a hot summer day. And, and he didn't say anything for a few minutes. And finally he said, do you remember, and he called his name, 
And he said, he started the Salvation Army. I said, oh, okay. And he said, he began to tell a story about this man who started the Salvation Army. And he said, he said, this man would gather his team together, his staff. And he would say, every one of us need to spend three minutes in, in hell. Every one of us need to do that. Because if we spent three minutes in hell, we would never, ever forget it. We would know how dreadful it is and how awful it is and it would put everything in perspective as believers and we would be more hot-hearted about evangelism. And he said, I've just spent three minutes in hell. <laughs> And he said, I can't wait to get back to my air-conditioned Lincoln. <laughs> this is the same thing that Paul is doing. He's reminding us of where we've come from. And we need to remember where we came from as believers to make, to, to make it even more sweet to know that we're children of God. So that's where we were. But now he says, what, that's what we were. But now he wants us to know what we will be. But before we're where we will be, quickly, let's look back at chapter 1 in Ephesians. Because Paul starts out saying, this is who you are in Christ. Then he says, by way of reminder, I'm going to tell you who you were. But we're going to look back and see who we are. Look at verse, uh, chapter 1 and verse 3 in Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Amen. If you're in Christ, that's us. How do you describe that? And he's just getting started. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. If there's a Anybody among us who can explain that perfectly, then have at it today. I sure can't. And he goes on to talk about being predestined and all of that. I can't explain that, but I tell you what, I'm not going to take the beauty away from it. Whatever it means, it's good. <laughs> he predestined us for adoption as sons. Here's that children thing. In or through Jesus Christ. According to the purpose of His will. He wanted to, to do this. To the praise of His glorious grace, not ours. With which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him, here we go. We have redemption through His blood. Forgiveness of our trespasses. According to the riches of His grace. And I always love to pause here and put this in perspective. And I always use this illustration. If... If Bill Gates walked through these doors and blessed us all out of his blessing, he could, he could give us five bucks, and that's blessing us out of his, his blessing. But if he blessed us according to his riches, we'd all leave here millionaires. You see what he's saying? We have been blessed according to his riches. You can't put a price on that. Everything Jesus has, we have as his children which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him. And He goes down to verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, and on and on and on. Somebody please say amen. amen. That's who we are in Christ. But he doesn't stop there. Back in our text in 1 John, he wants us to know what we will be. Look at chapter 3 and verse 2 again. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But what we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. This is amazing, isn't it? 
We go back to think about who Paul described us as before we knew Jesus. Who would even have anything to do with that? But God being holy, pure, righteous, only by His grace and mercy reached way down, way down pulled us up from where we were and did all of these things Paul spoke of in chapter 1. And now he's going to do even more. He's going to make us like his son. Amen. We will be like him. This is what it means to be children of God. We will be like Jesus. So we should realize our state but then we should realize his state. Look at verse 2 again. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And he is holy. And if you're in Christ, if you trusted Jesus as your Savior, if you've been saved, you are born again, you are born into the family of God, you are a child of God, and that is absolutely certain. It's written with the blood of Jesus in stone. And we will be like Him. He is holy. Look forward to conformity with Jesus. We, we celebrated yesterday the life of Miss Barbara Miller. She was a precious lady, is, but what she is now, you cannot imagine. Cannot imagine. And in Christ, we have that to look forward to. But secondly, I'm going to hurry. I told you, I don't know how in the world this sermon got so long. Look forward to conformity with Jesus. Look forward to it, folks. This life is short. The struggles here are short. They really are. We're celebrating 29 years of marriage today. 29 years? Where did it go? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I had to fit that in there somewhere. But I'm, I'm amazed. That I can't even believe I'm 29 years old. <laughs> to be married 29 years. So this life is short. But soon, guys and gals, we're going to be with Jesus We'll be conformed to Him. So, second point, rest in your completion. Rest in your completion. Miss Barbara Miller is completed. She has graduated. She's completed. And we will be as well. Look at verse 3. He says there, And everyone who thus hopes in Him, purifies Himself as He is pure. What does this mean? It is a natural response to verse 2. Because we are in Christ, because we are children of God, because of who we were in Christ changes to who we are and who we will be, that gives us hope to live holy lives now. To know that we can live holy now and separated lives because of who we will be. So I broke it down like this in four ways. The first thing is this. Your hope in the future gives you fuel to live a holy life now. We're different people now, guys and gals. We're different. We've been changed. We've been saved. We're not who we're going to be yet, but we're certainly not who we used to be. God has changed us. He is separating us. He is sanctifying us. And because of who we will be, we have power to live holy lives now. Secondly, resting in our completion now. Secondly, Jesus is the source of your holiness. Don't you dare try to live holy lives on your own power. You'll fail. It's impossible. But in the power of of the Lord Jesus Christ who had power enough to save us from who we were has the power for us to live holy lives. Rest in that. Trust Him, not yourself, not your own power. Your own power is driven by your, by your depraved flesh who's yet to be completed. But one day it will be and that's the power we have to live a holy life. Thirdly, 
resting in, in our completion, this is a guarantee. He says, all who... That's like Jesus saying, it is an absolute done deal. It's guaranteed. And finally, resting in our completion, it is a thorough guarantee. He says, as He is pure, we can be. We will be, and we can live holy lives now. It's a thorough. So He's not saying... You can live partially holy lives. You, you can struggle all the time. He's not saying that. He's saying you can make absolute progression, continually become more like me on this earth while you're trying to glorify me, while you're resting in me. You can be continually sanctified and made better and more like Jesus every day. And I know we struggle, folks. This flesh is irritating at times, isn't it? Irritating and frustrating. But rest in what you will be one day because of Jesus. Rest in that. And He helps us to have this, this desire and this goal that one day we will be made whole. I had a song um, last week that I was going to share with you, the words of. And Wayne Batson came to me last week and said, you've got to hear this song. He said, you plagiarized this guy. <laughs> and I actually went to it, Wayne, and something distracted me, and I forgot about it for a week. What's that all about? So he came to them this morning and said, did you hear that song? I said, oh, no. So I went back, had time to go back and look at it, and wow, talking about childhood, Certainty of childhood and what it does as a believer. This song is by Matthew West. It's called My Name Is. Listen to these lyrics. I'm just going to read them and we'll end on this. Hello, my name is Regret. I'm pretty sure we have met. Every single day of your life, I'm the whisper inside. Won't let you forget. Hello, my name is Defeat. I know you recognize me. Just when you think you can win, I'll drag you right back down again till you've lost all belief. These are the voices. These are the lies. And I have believed them for the very last time. Hello, my name is child of the one true king. I've been saved, I've been changed, and I have been set free. Amazing Grace is the song I sing. Hello, my name is child of the one true king. I am no longer defined by all the wreckage behind. The one who makes all things new has proven it's true. Take a look at my life. Hello, my name is child of the one true king. I've been saved, I've been changed, and I've been set free. Amazing Grace is the song I sing. Hello, my name is child of the one true King. What love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called His children. I am a child of, of the one true King. What a love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called His children. Hello, my name is child of the one true King. I've been saved, I've been changed, and I have been set free. Amazing Grace is a song I sing. Hello, my name is child of the one true king. I am a child of the one true king. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I am stunned today. For I clearly have been reminded of who I was and who I would be without Jesus. But He has lived a perfect life on this earth. He died in my place. He rose again, defeating the death that I was. And He reached way down and pulled me up out of sin, out of death, breathed life into me, 
and made me a child of the King. Father, I have no words but thank you. And I think that is true of all of us here today who are in Christ. You deserve glory for being our Father, for giving us the privilege of of being your children. So my prayer today, right now, God in Christ, is that all here today who have trusted Jesus will be reminded of who we are in Jesus, that we are a child of the King, and that is certain, that you'll seal that within us, and that it will give us hope and assurance and change us for your glory. But also, if there are any among us here today who have never trusted in Jesus, that you will make it clear to them that they desperately need Him, that they desperately need to be a child of God. And may they respond to the invitation of the gospel today to simply trust Jesus, to simply say, Jesus, I've sinned, forgive me of my sins and save me. I trust you. Lord, in our time of invitation, would you move among us and do what only you can do for your glory and our good. And we ask this in, in Jesus' name. Amen.